Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Is anyone fired up after that baptism video? That's awesome. Hey, we want to say hi to all of those of you watching online, wherever you might be watching from. We also want to say hi to those of you in Auditorium 8. We also want to welcome all of those of you here live in Auditorium 12. If this happens to be your first Sunday online or in person, we just want to say thank you. We're so glad that you're here and we hope to see you again. By the way, my name is Matt and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Now, usually I'll kick off a new series by going, man, like I'm super fired up, but I have to be a little bit honest today. Today, I'm a little bit nervous because we're kicking off a new series and the series is called Confessions of a Flawed Pastor. Now, you might be thinking, why in the world would you share your flaws with people out loud? And the whole idea behind this whole series, I can sum up in one sentence and I'm going to put it up on the screen and it's this right here. Admitting my failures. Listen, listen, if you know me, I got some failures. So I'm going to admit my failures publicly so Okay, the first service did way better, but it's not a competition, okay? So, so you can avoid them personally. Listen, I'm going to admit my failures publicly on record for all of eternity, but the goal of that is so that you can avoid them personally. Because here's what I've discovered. There's often this unspoken myth about pastors or those people who work in churches. And these unspoken myths go something like this. Well, if you're a pastor, you work at a church, you have it all together. And if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. But that's just not true. Just ask anyone that knows me. And then other people believe, listen, if you're a pastor, you work in a church, well, then God gives you a pass from life's problems. I don't know where those two ideas came true, came from, but they're definitely not true in my life and true of me. And my hope and my prayer is that by admitting my failures and my flaws, you could avoid them personally, right? And so here's some of the confessions over the next couple of weeks that I'm going to make and I'm going to put them up on the screen. And it's this right there. I've struggled with doubt. I don't know about you, but you're probably thinking, well, if you're a pastor and you've been a follower of Jesus so long, do you ever still struggle with doubt? And the answer is, come back and find that. My biggest parenting error, error, listen, I got two beautiful daughters that I love and cherish, but man, if I could go back and change some things, I would. I've been a financial misfit. Got anybody else in the audience that's been a financial misfit before? And man, this one really hurts. I've been a disengaged spouse, man, given more effort to my job and my career than to my home. I've misunderstood my purpose. And and as I looked at this list of things that I had to confess, maybe so that you can avoid the pain that I've experienced, here's what I saw about the list. Regardless of where you're at in responding to Jesus, maybe you showed up and you have no faith and you're just checking out this Jesus thing. Maybe you showed up and you grew up with something other than Jesus. Or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus since you're a little kid. What I've discovered is whether it's doubt, parenting, finances, spouse, or purpose that most of us will have to deal with these issues at least once in our lifetime. So regardless of where we're at, I bet that most of us have struggled or will deal with these things. People often ask me, well, Matt, aren't pastors, aren't leaders supposed to be held to appropriate standard? And the answer is yes. Listen, I want you to know, man, I sleep guilt-free. I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says it so well. He writes a church a lot like South Point, made up of all different kinds of people. And, and he writes these words here in, second, in Corinthians, and I'll put them on the screen. He says, my conscience is clear. What he means he's saying is, listen, I'm aiming at the right thing, but then I love his truthfulness. But he goes, but that does not make me, what's the word? Innocent. Listen, I can tell you with a clear and good conscience, man, that I am trying to bring honor to Jesus and to love people around me and love my family. But sometimes I just get it wrong. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't mean I got it all right. Now, here's what I discovered about aiming and then missing the mark. Is what we need to not miss the mark is we need wisdom. We need truth. But there's two kind of ways to get this wisdom and truth. And so I'm a, now listen, this isn't going to be rocket scientists, but man, you're going to like this. Here's two ways to kind of learn this wisdom and truth, right? And we're going to put them on the screen. We can learn the, or we can learn the, easy way. Listen, listen, I've spent my whole life, listen, ask anyone that knows me. I'm a knucklehead, right? Listen, I've spent most of my life learning the, hard way. The hard way is, is you don't listen to anybody. The hard way is you go, I know better than everyone else. I'm not going to listen to anyone. The hard way is going to go, I'm going to figure it out on my the problem with that is, is you don't listen to anyone. You don't learn from other people's mistakes so that we and I specifically have experienced all the pain, all the loss and all the, you know, the frustration and all the like kind of things that don't work when you learn the 
But there, did, you, did you know there's an, there's an easy way? The easy way is somebody's gone before you, right? Somebody has learned all those pains and all those mistakes, and they will usually tell you or give you wisdom and truth so that you can avoid. Did you know that this is? <laughs> and here's what I've discovered. There is a vast difference between the price tags of the hard way and the easy way. And my hope and my prayer through this series is that some of the lessons I learned the hard way, you might learn the easy way so that you can avoid loss and pain and damage. And so my first confession is something that is kind of core. We, if, we, if we don't get this one, then much else won't really follow if we, if we don't really get this one. So again, here's my first confession as I kick off the series. And here's the confession, is it, and it's this right here. I'm gonna put it on the screen. I fell for the myth. It's not true, but I fell for the myth that unconditional love magically undoes the consequences of my poor choices. I figured, listen, I heard the greatest news ever that there's a God who made me and a God who loves me and a God who wants to be my friend and Jesus died for me. So unconditional love means I can make moronic choices and God will fix it. Why are you laughing? Now, we may laugh when I word it this way, but here's what I'm asking. I wonder how many of us have made choices believing that we are the 1% that gets away with it. That we somehow believe that unconditional love or because we're born in America or because we're popular or because we're loved or because we're talented, we can make poor choices and undo the consequences of those things. Which led me to a truth. Like, listen, listen, I've been living life long enough. I've done this. I've learned the hard way, right? But here's what I discovered, and it's on this next slide, and it's this. God's gift of unconditional love through Christ Jesus. Listen, God gifts you, God gifts me, God gifts the world unconditional love through Christ Jesus. Listen, here's the best news that you will hear today. It's not only that you matter deeply to God, but that God can't love you any more than he already has. We have a saying here at South Point that goes like this, anyone that would die for you is for you. God can't love you any more than he does. But there's a flip side of that coin because love always requires a choice, right? Outcomes are conditional upon our choices. See, listen, trouble comes to us all. I get it. Not all the things that we experience are our fault. But the reality is most of the sum of our life is conditional upon our choices that we make. And when we believe the myth that God's unconditional love will undo the consequences of our poor choices, we end up with pain. Let me, let me give you an example. Like whenever I share a story, I always want to share old stories so you don't think I'm so bad. But this story literally happened like, like three or four years ago. And so if you look at me on screen or in person, you're probably like, hey, bro, you need to go back to the gym. Um, I used to go to the gym. I power lifted. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I used to go Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. I miss my gym crew. What's up to my gym crew? Miss you guys. Someday I'll be back there, right? And so I was on my way to the gym. I had gotten stuck at work one, one afternoon later than I wanted to be. And have you ever like gotten somewhere when you're in the car on autopilot? Am I the only one that's ever, like you're thinking about something, you don't really realize what you're doing. And all of a sudden I heard the honk of a horn behind me. I was going too slow. So someone passed and I gave him, have you ever had the wave of shame? Like when you know it's your fault, you know? So I gave the wave of shame when I kind of dumped my head and kind of went like this. Yeah, my fault. Like, sorry, bro. Like my fault. And the other person in the car, the young man gave me the howdy doody signal. He's like, hey, you, this is what I think of your uh, wave of shame. I'm like, bro, I gave you the wave of shame, you know, come on, man. And he gave me the wave of something else, right? So then he pulls over in front of me and kind of slows down, hits his brake. And I'm like, man, that's okay, man. I'm sorry, man. I, I was just in thought. I didn't mean to burn. And he, he's still giving me the wave of shame, gives me the wave of shame about five or six more times and then pulls off. But you know what I've discovered when you race and do something stupid like that? The red lights are the great equalizer in life. <laughs> so there's this light right before my gym. And guess what? I pull up right behind this young man at this light. And so he sees me and he proceeds to give me kind of the like howdy doody sign again and again. Now, I need to let you know something. You can take the boy out of the hood. You can't always take the hood out of the boy. So he keeps doing it and finally I go like, listen, you're just not gonna bully me. So I get out of my car. I go over to his window and knock on his window. This is Pastor Matt. Now his expression as I knock on his window has changed from howdy doody to what is he going to do? So he cracks the window and I go, I, I didn't cuss, I didn't yell. I was just polite. I was like, hey, 
I'm really sorry, man. I didn't mean to make you have a miserable day, man. I'm really sorry. That's all I said. And I went to walk away. And then he yells through the crack of his window, yeah, you better walk away. Or I'd beat your bleep. To this is again where your pastor, who needs Jesus every day just like you do, turns, looks him straight in the eye and says, not today. Now in that moment, I realized that I made a poor because if he had gotten out of the car, I only had two really bad options. The first option is to let him wail on me, right? And then show up at church all black and blue and people are like, what happened? Well, I got out of my car, somebody flipped me off and I knocked in the window and I told him to have a great day, right? Like, they're like, hey, you're a moron, right? Or my other choice was to get into a fist fight, which would be recorded on somebody's cell phone and your pastor would be on St. Mary's today. <laughs> Why are you laughing? This is a really bad situation. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't that God didn't love me. It wasn't that God wasn't for me. I made a bad choice. I made a poor choice. And God's unconditional love does not undo the consequences of our poor choices because love always requires choice. And as I was thinking about sharing this truth that we often buy into the myth that somehow our, our poor choices get undone because we regret them, and then we deal with the pain. And it got me thinking, is there anyone online, is there anyone in Auditorium 8 or in this room, maybe you drank too much, ate too much, or did something too much that you knew you shouldn't have done. And then when you suffer the consequence, you go, God, why did you let that happen? And God goes, that wasn't my idea. How many of us have ever bought something we couldn't afford? And then when we couldn't pay our bills, we're mad at God that he didn't send a check in the mail. How many times have we been in an immoral situation on a website, at a bar, with somebody else that we're not supposed to be with, or we do something we know is not wrong, so we put pleasure ahead of our purpose. And when the consequences rain down, we go, God, why are you letting this happen to me? And God goes, I didn't ask you to do that. I wonder how many times in life we learn the hard way that unconditional love does not undo the consequences of our poor choices. Now, there is a silver lining today in all of this. It's why I woke up before my alarm. And my alarm set for dark 30, but I, I was fired up. And, and here's some good news. Here's the best news for you. You can just, just go ahead and smile. It's okay. You're not alone. I'm not alone. We're not only the only morons in all the world. Matter of fact, this has been a problem throughout all of human history that people believe because our creator loves us that we can make stupid choices and he'll bail us out is a problem that we've been dealing with since the very beginning. Matter of fact, this was so important. This is such a big issue that humanity's faced that Jesus himself addresses this very issue. And what I love about Jesus is Jesus is a truth teller, but he tells us truth in love. So we pick it up in the eyewitness account. We're going to put it up on the screen. This is Jesus. He's speaking to a crew, uh, kind of like you and I right here. And it happens in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew. And he says, all who listen to my instructions and follow them. Now I want to stop here. I'm going to go a little old school preacher. Got any parents in the house? Got any parents in the house? Do you know if you're a parent, you know there's a difference between your kids hearing you and your kids listening, right? Can I get an amen, right? Maybe you can type amen in the chat because there's a difference between hearing and listen. When you listen, you actually do them. See, if you listen to my instructions and follow them, see, Nike didn't come up with just do it. Jesus has been saying just do it since the beginning, right? So he said, listen, if you all who listen to my instructions and follow them, they are wise. You see, Jesus says following my instructions, like believing and following my truth, isn't necessarily about do you get to go to heaven or do you not get to go to heaven? Not does heaven come and live inside of you so you can live the kind of life that's worth living forever because Jesus already paid for that on the cross. You can't earn it or work for it. Man, that's great news, right? This is about are you wise? He says, like a person who builds their house on solid rock, though the rain comes and the torrents and the floods rise and the storms and the winds beat against their house, it will not collapse because it's built on the rock. And what I love about Jesus is Jesus is a truth teller. Jesus tells us, one is, hey, listen, I got some instructions and if you follow them, that will make you this isn't about getting to heaven. It's about are you being wise or are you being foolish in a second? But what I love about Jesus, he's also a truth teller. He says, listen, no one gets a pass. The winds and the rains and the storms, they come to everyone. Jesus says, in this world, you all have trouble. Listen, if you go to anyone and they tell you that you will get a pass from pain and problems in this world, they are not in line with what Jesus says. 
Jesus lived the perfect best life ever and it got him on a cross. But Jesus isn't finished. Here's what Jesus continues to say. He says, there's a flip side of this. Jesus says this in the next slide. But those who hear my, do you see he changed the word? Jesus said, listen, it's not those who listen. He says, but those who hear my instructions and what's the word? Come on now, church. Now, now here's what I know what you're thinking. You go, man, someone needs to hear this. Whenever you're in church and you go, someone needs to hear this, you know who God's talking to? <laughs> you. He's not talking to your spouse. He's not talking to your kids. He's talking to you. He says, but those who hear my instructions and ignore them, they are foolish. Again, this isn't about do you get to go to heaven or do you not get to go to heaven? This is about are you being wise? Or are you being foolish? Are you going to learn the or the isn't that a great question for all of us here today, whether you're online or auditorium mate or here? Are we being wise or foolish? Are we learning the hard way or the easy way? It's like a person who builds their house on the sand for when the rains and the floods come and the storm and the winds beat against the house, it will fall with a mighty crash. Listen, here's the truth that Jesus tells us. All of us will experience unwanted pain. None of us get through life without some damage or some dysfunction or some defect. That's just the way the world's broken. That's why Jesus came and he conquered hell and death and he's gonna come back someday and fix it. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus loves you and he wants you to have life. But because he loves you and love requires choice, we get to choose either wise choices or foolish choices. We can choose the hard way or we can choose the easy way. And Jesus is trying to say, please choose the wise way so that you don't have to experience unnecessary pain. Listen, the world's gonna bring you, the world's gonna bring me enough of the unwanted pain for ourselves. There's no need to add unnecessary pain. If we choose the wise way, we can avoid that. And so if we want to avoid that, we, here's something we need to do. There are three principles that will help you and I not fall for the myth that God's unconditional love is going to somehow undo the consequences of our poor choices. These three principles will help us not choose the hard way. It'll actually help us choose the easy way. And the first principle that I'm going to talk about, you might be going like, well, isn't that going to like kind of lead to this myth? But it's so necessary. I'm going to get there. But here's the principle number one, is that God loves us. What's that word? Unconditionally in Christ Jesus. Listen, Jesus doesn't love us because of what we do. God loves us because that's who he is. You know the best news today when you walk through the doors at South Point is you're going to hear not only that you matter deeply, God, but you can't earn your way into a relationship with God. You can't come to church enough, read your Bible enough, give enough, or serve enough. Those aren't the things that get us to heaven. Jesus already finished it. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to pay our debt on a cross that we couldn't pay. God can't love you. God can't love you any more than he already does. And by the way, that's not even my idea. You see, there was this guy, his name's Paul. Now you have to understand something about Paul. Paul was not an original follower of Jesus. You see, Paul actually used to persecute Christians. Matter of fact, Paul actually used to help execute Christians. It wasn't until Paul encountered a risen Jesus. You see, the historical fact is the tomb of Christ is empty. And Paul encountered a risen Jesus. He became a Jesus follower and he started these things called Jesus communities. We've labeled them as churches, right? And he writes one of these churches about God's love. And here's the one who used to persecute Christians and kill Christians who encountered a risen Jesus, got forgiven, not because of what he'd done, because of what Jesus is. And he writes a church in Rome, a lot like us. It's made up of some people who are exploring Jesus. Some people who came from different faith backgrounds. Some people grew up in the church. It's kind of this hodgepodge of all kinds of people. And here's what he writes them about God's unconditional love. Here's what he says. But God showed, and see, this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus doesn't talk a good game. Jesus delivers. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. You know that thing you're never, ever going to share? You know that thing that you regret most? You know that thing that you know is the worst about you, the thing that's broken on the inside of you, that you know breaks you, breaks the world, and breaks the heart of God? It says this, it says, he sent his son Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When you and I were doing our worst, 
God looked at us and loved us and sent a son. It says this, even when we were God's, what's the word? Enemies. Even when we were God's enemy, when we were stiff arming God and say, God, I know it's wrong. I'm going to choose to do it anyway. He says, even when we were his enemies, he made peace with us. For his part, God is our friend. It's not us who need to try to win God. It's us who need to respond. He says, when we were enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. God sent heaven's best. God cannot love you any more than he already does. His love is not based on your works or your effort or your talent or your abilities. It is based on who he is. You see, you were meant to be a daughter of the Most High. You were meant to be a son of the Most High. You have a good father in heaven. Listen, we're all busted on earth and most of our relationships are transactional, but God is nothing like that. God loves you because of who he is, not because of what we do. I want to show you a picture, show you a picture of my family. This is a picture of my family. We were all at the beach and we got a family photo. Um, Sometimes I'll refer to them as my adopted family, but they're really the family that I know and love. My mom died when I was nine. My biological dad kind of got rid of me at about 12, 12, half, took me to the uh, police station. And when I was homeless um, and needed a place to stay, my adopted mom and dad, they took me in and And they called me their son. The problem is uh, the son that they took in is the same guy who after like 30 or 40 years of following Jesus, you remember the guy that knocked on the window, right? Well, when I was 16 and a half, when they took me in, I, I was not the person who you see standing before you. You know, I struggled with addiction. I was stubborn. I was selfish. I was lazy. I was a know it all. I was arrogant. And sometimes I was downright rebellious. And what's amazing is my adopted family, they didn't love me because I got it right. Matter of fact, I got it wrong most of the time. But they loved me because they chose to call me their own. I'll never forget one Christmas. I was working. It was on Christmas Eve and we were supposed to see the grandparents after Christmas Eve. I got off work a little bit early with a couple of other co-workers. We'd shut the place, the restaurant down. So we did what all of us knuckleheads did back in the day. We, we drank way too much, smoked too much, did, did a bunch of bad things all together. And I looked at my watch and realized that I was supposed to be home a little while ago. They were supposed to be leaving and said, hey man, I need to get home. I need someone to give me a ride. Um, so someone dropped me off. I stumbled out of the car. Literally my family with all my sisters who were all younger at the time and my adopted mom and dad were in the car and I stumbled out of the car and they're literally pulling out and my dad said, are you okay? And like I stumbled and mumbled something and he just looked at me and just said, get in the car. It would have been so easy for my mom and dad to go, how dare you? We've tried to love you and just kick me to the curb and make me uh, experience Christmas Eve by myself. But instead, because I was their own, they continued to take me in. They modeled what unconditional love looks like. For God's part, he is your best friend. God loves you because of who he is, not because of what you've done. That is the greatest news in all of eternity. And the reason it's important is because if we don't believe that God unconditionally loves us, then we won't trust his instructions or his commands to live life. Trust is so important. And here's why trust is so important, because it leads directly into principle number two, which is this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Most of life's outcomes are, what's that word? Conditional upon our choices. Listen, I get it. Tragedy happens to us all. You can exercise and eat and be fit and have a heart attack. You can be married to someone you love and you do all the right things and something breaks in them and it it goes wrong. You can work and be good at your job and your company can go. Like sometimes tragedy happens, but most of life's outcomes are conditional upon our choices. The reality is, is God's love is unconditional, but the life that we experience is often the sum of our choices. And it's actually the sum of the quality of the choices that we make. And this isn't like, like, listen, here's the good thing. If you're mad and going, I wish I didn't show up today, this isn't even my idea. This comes straight from God. This guy, the Apostle Paul, who wrote that church, He also wrote something else. And what I love is he wrote a church a lot like this. They were in Galatia. And matter of fact, they had this idea that they were supposed to earn their way to heaven. And the the apostle Paul says, no, don't you get it? It's unconditional. You can't work or earn for it. So then they went crazy. They were like, well, if I get to go to heaven and God loves me, I can just be stupid. He's like, well, you missed the point. And here's what he writes him. He writes him this. He says this in Galatians 6, 9. He says, don't be, what's that word? Misled. Don't mistake and don't confuse unconditional love as a promise to undo poor choices. You can't ignore God and get away with it. Now, come on now. How many of us, we already know the right thing to do. You didn't need to come here today. The problem isn't do we know the right thing. The problem is do we? 
Because here's what we want to do. We, like, this is me. Maybe it's not you. Maybe y'all wait. I want to do what I want to do and then ask God to fix my mess. And church circles, we like, God, would you bless my mess for me? Right? Isn't that what we do? I'm going to show up Sunday. I'm going to put a little something there. I'm going to serve. But I want to live how I want to live. And then I'm going to ask you to fix it. He says, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will experience the hard way, the pain, and the loss of that. A person will always reap just the kind of crop they sow. Listen, I'm not going to tell you. You already know this. You learned this in elementary science, right? For every action, there's an opposite and equal before Isaac Newton, Jesus said, you will reap what you sow. You see, and here's why. This is so important. Like, listen, hey, listen, everyone lean in. This is, this is so important. You see, love, genuine love always requires the freedom of choice because forced love isn't love. But if you give someone freedom and undo the consequences of the poor choice, it's no longer freedom. If God fixed every poor decision we make, then we're no longer actually free to make our choices because God's just fixing them behind. So here's the reality. The freedom of love is inseparable from the law of consequences. Don't be misled. Don't ignore the reality. That God loves us, so he gives us freedom because God is love, right? And love requires choice. And the choices that we make matter, they're inseparable. Whatever we sow, we will. Whatever action we take, there'll be an equal and opposite reaction. I experienced this the hard way. I was in my early 20s. I worked for the Federal Aviation Administration. They have a place in Loudoun County. And I was a short order cook um, at this little restaurant inside this building. One day, one of my coworkers came in. He was all jazzed up. He had this cool leather jacket. And I noticed he had a motorcycle home. And he's like, I bought a motorcycle. I was like, dude, that's so awesome, right? So we go outside. And man, he's got this nice motorcycle. Man, it's a bum, 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 bum. So that night, I go home. And I go, Dad, man, one of my coworkers, he got this awesome motorcycle. Dad, I want to get a motorcycle. And my dad said, do you know how to ride a motorcycle? And I lied because I wanted a motorcycle. So I said, yes, but my dad was smarter than I am. He knew how to ride a motorcycle. So he asked me a question because you don't know how to ride a motorcycle. I go, no, I don't, dad. And he's like, listen, son, do not, do not ride that motorcycle. When you're at that job, do not ride that motorcycle. So what do you think I did? Oh, I rode that motorcycle right into a brick wall. No lie, about a week later, my friend and I get off work off the same shift, right? And we're going outside. It's a beautiful sunny day. He fires that bad boy. He's like, hey, do you know how to ride a motorcycle? I said, of course I know how to ride a motorcycle. I'm flying. He's like, do you want to ride my motorcycle? Yeah, absolutely. Did, and then I was like, I could hear my dad's voice. Do not ride the motorcycle. I'm like, I'm riding that motorcycle. So I get on that motorcycle. I pop the clutch. But I miss the gears because I haven't had any practice. I really don't know how to ride the motorcycle. And I run straight into a brick wall. Now, the good news is I lived. The bad news is I bent the forks, I injured myself, and my friend was mad. I mean, I, he could tell that I'd lied to him. He's like, you don't know how to ride a motorcycle. You just ran into a brick wall. I said, I'm sorry, man. He said, sorry, this is my brand new motorcycle. You need to pay for it. And then he wanted me to buy him a whole new motorcycle. So I had to go home and tell my dad, I go, dad, um, I got to buy my friend a motorcycle and I'll have the money. Can you loan it to me? He's like, you mean the motorcycle I told you not to drive, right? Oh yeah, that one, dad, that one right there. And he's like, you're a moron. So he comes and looks at the bike. I had to fix the thing. And it, just, it cost me money. I injured myself. I got in trouble with my dad. And my friend was mad at me. Not because God didn't love me, but because I made a poor choice. See, I didn't trust my dad enough to believe that he had my best when he said, hey, do not ride that motorcycle. And I wonder how many people online or here in person God has spoken to your heart. Please don't do that. Please stop. Please listen to the words of Jesus. And you keep hitting that wall. And it's not a mo motorcycle that you're breaking and damaging. It's your life, and your relationships. Because you don't trust that the God who would die for you is for you. Don't be misled. God will love you and you can get to heaven, but you can get to heaven in a broken life. When Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Which leads me, well, what are we supposed to do? 
What if we're aiming at the right thing, but we don't know what to do? Like, what, how do we make sure that we're, that we're listening and, and, and following the things that Jesus leads to principle number three? We're going to put it up here. Is that God gives us wisdom and God gives us wisdom and truth so we can avoid unnecessary pain. Listen, here's the reality. All of us are going to experience unwanted pain in life. That's just the bustedness and brokenness of the world. But we don't need to add unnecessary pain on top of the unwanted pain. Anyone that adds unwanted pain on top of the unnecessary pain is learning the hard Got any hard way learners in the house? I'm chief. Hard way learner. I don't need to add unnecessary pain to the unwanted pain that I already have. What will help me avoid that is having the wisdom and truth that Jesus came. Jesus came so that you and I, and he taught us how to live. He said, put God first. Love your neighbors yourself. It's not easy. It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always look like the right thing. But if you do that, it'll work out. God gives us wisdom and truth so that we can avoid unnecessary pain. So that we can learn the easy way. We can learn ahead of time. You know, I want to give you an example of this. I'm going to show you a picture. I want to show you a picture. I'm going to put this little picture right up here. There's, it's a picture's coming, I promise. There's a picture of me. I don't know if you know it's me, but like you can see, I got a Tyvek suit, right? I got a mask. I got a little headlight. Uh, this summer, my wife and I, we insulated our attic, and we decided to insulate our attic in the middle of July, one of the hottest days of the year. That's all right. I'm a moron, but you're listening to me. Right? So we insulate our attic. And you know what I discovered is there's something awesome called YouTube. Did you know that you can, if you, if you type in something you want to fix on YouTube, there are people who've made videos about how to fix things. And if you don't know how to fix it, you can watch a YouTube video and you can see all the pain and mistakes they make so that you can avoid them. So we insulated our attic and it looks beautiful. It's awesome. And I've never insulated an attic before, but I learned the Come on, second service. I learned the easy way instead of the hard way. Because someone had gone before me and taught me so that I could avoid the brick wall, so I could avoid the pitfalls, I could avoid the loss and the damage. Jesus came so that you, so that I, that he would give us wisdom and truth so that you and I can avoid loss and pitfalls and damage because he loves us not because he wants to manipulate us or control us or keep us down or keep us from life, but because he loves us. That's what he came to do. I mean, if I was going to wrap up all those three principles that God loves us unconditionally, but our outcomes are conditional upon the quality of our choices. And lastly, that God gives us the gift of wisdom and truth so that we can avoid unnecessary pain. I would sum up the whole message in a statement like this. Here would be the statement. The freedom of love is inseparable from the law of consequences. Everyone here, I mean, we're all here. We're America, right? We all love freedom, right? And this has kind of been a week to celebrate. Listen, when there is oppression and when there is, is evil, that, that harm happens, that we love the ability of freedom. But freedom is inseparable inseparable from the consequences of choices. If we have the freedom and love provides that, you can't undo the consequences of the choices that we make because true love will never force anyone to do something they don't want to do. God will never force you to take the easy way. God's heart is broken when we chose the hard way. And Jesus wanted you and wanted me to know that he loved us so much to avoid the hard way that he sent his son who showed us what life looks like. And he went through the hardest thing to pay for our brokenness so that you can know that anyone that would die for you is for you. Close with a true story. It's probably again in my early 20s, you can tell there's a, the theme of my knuckleheadedness in my young ages. Uh, I had a car, my very first car. I had it four days, <laughs> and then I crashed it. Can you, can you see that thing here? Like, I'm Crash Bandicoot. Like, I'm really good at Mario Kart now, though, but like in my early days, man, I wrecked a lot of things. I had a car. I had it for four days. I wrecked it. It got totaled. Um, I lived. Don't worry. Even though I went in the ambulance, right? I lived, right? But I had to go get another car. So my, my dad went with me, and there was this 68 convertible firewood that, that I used to drive by on my way to work. And I said, Dad, I want to buy this old car. It's a 68 convertible firewood. 
Firebird. And my dad said, I'll go with you, son, to take a look at it. So we went to look at it. My dad looked at me and he said, son, you do not want to buy this car. I looked at him, dad, I want to buy this car. He said, son, you don't know how to work on cars. And I go, that's okay, dad, I'll learn how. He goes, you don't even have any tools. I go, that's okay, I'll use yours. He goes, no, you won't. Right? I Because, son, you don't like to work on cars. You like to go have fun. Like, you're not going to want this. Oh, dad, I'll learn. It'll be fun. It'll be my new hobby. He said, son, this car, because it's old, it'll leave you on the side of the road. It's okay, dad. I'll like it. Look how beautiful. He goes, son, it's an economic, it's not a good economical car. Any money that you put into it, you're not going to get out. But dad, I love it. Look how cool, man. I, it was convertible. I'll put some craggers in the sound system. Man, I'll be fly. <laughs> boom, boom. You can see me rolling down the street. But my dad, in love, because I was 18 and because my biological mom had left me some money to be able to buy this car, he said, son, you're, you're, you're 18 now. If this is the car you want to buy, he gave me all the reasons why I shouldn't buy it. He said, son, I would, I would tell you, if you've ever trusted me, please don't buy this car. I said, thanks, dad, and I bought the car. I bought the car. I put almost $10,000 on it. It left me stranded on the side of the road. I was not good at working on it, and I invested a lot of money, and I sold it for about 1500 bucks. Yeah, oh no, it's right. <laughs> Whoever said that out loud. Man, you ain't lying. That's an ouchie right there, right? And here's the, here's the thing. I could have avoided getting stuck on the side of the road. I could have avoided the pain of having to work on it. And I could have avoided the financial loss if I had just... Listen. If I had just trusted that my dad actually had my best interests. And I want to ask a question. You're laughing at my stupid decision about a car. But I wonder how many of us are not listening to our Heavenly Father and it's not a car that you're experiencing loss on. It's not a car that you're experiencing pain on. It's not a car that you're experiencing loss. It's your life. Jesus came so that we could learn the easy way, so that we could experience life and life to the full through His truth and through His wisdom. So I have three simple challenges. Whether you're online or Auditorium 8 or Auditorium 12, I want to ask, have you ever received the unconditional love of God found in Jesus? And I'm not talking about knowing about the unconditional love. I'm not even talking believing the unconditional. I'm saying, is there a day that you've said yes? Is there a day? And it's so simple. It's, I call it the ABCs. Have you admitted that you have failed and that Jesus is God's son? And have you believed that Jesus lived and he died and his tomb is empty and he paid your price and my price and the world's price for our brokenness? And have you committed not to perfection, but to the direction of following Jesus and putting Jesus first? If you've done the A, B's and C's, then you have surrendered to his unconditional love. But if you haven't done that, today is a day that you can say yes to Jesus. Now, some of you here, you've already done that. We saw in the baptism video people who were, who were making a proclamation that they've surrendered, that they're going to trust in the commands and the wisdom and the truth of Jesus. Maybe if you're here and you've already done that, I want to ask, is there an area of your life that you know that you're not following God's wisdom or truth and that you're hoping God's unconditional love will bless your mess? Maybe just for one week you would trust God's wisdom and you would, you would follow what Jesus tells you to do. And maybe you're here today and maybe you're in a place where neither one of those is something you're ready to risk. And that's really, South, place is a, South Point is a place where you can come as you are, but none of us have to stay that way. This is a safe place. Here's, here's a challenge for you. My challenge for you would be that you would come back next Sunday. Hey, let me pray for our time. Uh, if you would bow your heads, my mic went out, but I'll pray out loud for everyone here. Heavenly Father, for anyone here that had not surrendered, Um, to the love of God, the uh, unconditional love of God found in Jesus. God, I just pray that they would admit that Jesus, you are who you say you are, and that we all fail, that they would believe that the tomb is empty, and they would commit to following you. God, for wherever we've made our mistakes, wherever we've gone our own way, God, I pray that you would supernaturally, God, just step in. God, that you would help us turn and follow you because you came that we might have life and life to the full. God, whether it's the challenge to come back next week or to follow your instructions or to surrender to your unconditional love, God, I pray as we leave here that we would know in our knower that we matter deeply to you and that you love us unconditionally and want to see us experience life and life to the full. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, amen.